Hi, everyone. So welcome to the Expert Roundtable, the future of metadata after Hive's Metastore. So today we have a very interesting discussion. So we're going to talk about data lake metadata management. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the past, uh, which involves a lot of Hive's Metastore, uh, kind of a key component uh, in modern data architectures, uh, still is to this day. Uh, and of course, we're going to talk a lot about the future uh, of data lakes and what it means for metadata. Um, whether or not Hive's Metastore is a part of it, uh, and if not, what can replace it. Um, so hopefully a very interesting discussion. Um, so maybe first let's introduce our panel. So joining us today is Ryan Blue. Uh, Ryan is the co-creator of Apache Iceberg, uh, next generation table format for data lakes. Uh, he's also co-founder and CEO of Tabular. We also have Seshu Adunuthula. Uh, Seshu is the director uh, of data platform at Intuit. Uh, joining us as well is Lior Ebel, uh, director of software architecture uh, for big data at Salesforce. Uh, and myself, I'm Oz Katz. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Trevers, the company behind LakeFS, which is an open source data lake versioning tool. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so before we get started with the actual discussion, I thought maybe just to frame the conversation, uh, maybe I could like talk briefly for a couple of minutes about what the Metastore actually is, just to make sure like everyone's on the same level. Um, so let me just present something real quickly. Um, yes. All right. Um, so what is Hive Metastore? Uh, so once upon a time, uh, a long time ago, uh, there was a new project called Hive, uh, which was basically a data warehouse on top of Hadoop. Uh, so there, there was this shiny new thing uh, called MapReduce and HDFS. And it was like the biggest hype uh, around 2006 or so. Um, and then someone thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could just like run analytics queries in SQL uh, on top of those files uh, on that HDFS on that shared file system. Um, so Hive was born as kind of like an abstraction, a SQL abstraction on top uh, of those technologies. Um, and one of the components inside Hive uh, was called Metastore. And what it did basically was like provide the other parts uh, of, of the storage story here. Um, the files itself, the data itself would sit in something like HDFS or any Hadoop compatible file system. Um, but then we need some way to map those files into a table. Uh, and that's kind of what the Metastore was born to do. So you, inside it, you would manage those entities for tables and partitions, managing stuff like privileges, like everything a modern data warehouse or database would manage. Uh, it would just provide those abstractions on top of the file system. Uh, so it was kind of a separated component. Uh, it had a kind of nice separation between data and metadata inside the project. Um, yeah. As time evolved, the Metastore itself uh, kind of like became its own standalone thing um, because there are other technologies that started adopting it. Uh, so they can all speak with the same like table structure and the same entities. Um, it's a Java project as most things in Hadoop are uh, based on some relational database. Uh, typically this would be something like MySQL or Postgres. I think they also support other more esoteric uh, stuff. Um, and it's a client server-ish Kind of a deployment model where it exposes a thrift interface um, but for various reasons which i'm sure we'll also talk about it's pretty common for other systems or users to kind of talk to the database directly uh, whether it's for performance or for other reasons stuff that's not exposed directly in the api um, and as i said it's been around uh like kind of from the beginning of the century so it's been a while since 2008 um, just kind of put that in perspective. Here's our few things um, which Hive is older than. Um, so we had Hive before Obama was elected, which is kind of a weird way to think about the world. Uh, we didn't have Android yet. Uh, it also, like, it, it, I think the first commit happened about two weeks before, like, the 2008 uh, subprime uh, mess started uh, with Lehman Brothers crashing. Um, and it also predates like the Bitcoin white paper, if that's interesting to anyone. So we had Hive before we had Bitcoin. Um, so with Hadoop, that's kind of like a couple of different ways where you can spend a lot of compute resources. Um, so that's basically at a high level what Hive at a store is. Do any of you want to add something to that description? 
no, you covered it well. Yeah, I did not know Android did not exist then, so that was that was interesting. But yes, <laughs> yeah, I think it's also like a couple of weeks before or something like that. Okay. A lot <laughs> happened around that time in two thousand eight. Um, yeah, okay, so so maybe that's a let's get started with the discussion itself. So I think maybe a, a good question to kind of th kick things off. Um, so given it has been like a while since it's been released, right? People are using like that core technology, maybe not Hive as much, but the Metastore itself um, for 13 years now. So like given your knowledge of the ecosystem and how things are going, like how do you explain how it survived for so long? How is this still relevant 13 years later? I, I could Before go jump in, yeah. Um, I don't think it's because of lack of trying. There, there is, if you look at AWS, AWS has a blue catalog. Uh, Databricks, I think, recently announced Unity. I think all the cloud vendors, like Azure has this Azure data catalog. Um, I think GCS also has its own version. The um, challenge that I see, though, is each of these cloud vendors, they um, uh, their meta stores or catalogs kind of work well within the environment that... Um, uh, that they come in, right? Is AWS kind of fit, fit the, uh, the Glue catalog fits well within the AWS ecosystem. Uh, Databricks Unity catalog kind of fits well within their environment. A lot of, for companies like Intuit, we will be heterogeneous. We will have multiple um, th multiple things deployed, right? We have both, uh, we have a lot of AWS deployments. We are a reasonably uh, a reasonable sized Databricks. And once we get into these heterogeneous environments, things kind of fall apart. That is the um, a catalog that the, that or a meta store that particular vendor provides is does not work out. And then you have to go to the base common denominator. And the base common denominator happens to be the Hive meta store. So we still it still survives out there. It still keeps going on in there. The reason this particular conversation is exciting to me is precisely that. Right is there needs to be an investment in the space. There needs to be uh, something we need to do more that goes across, like a spark is something that we know it works for um, irrespective of what particular technology stack I pick. I should be able to do the same thing with the metadata stores as well. And um, like when you and me chatted about LakeFS, that's a good place for us. It is essentially getting to the next generation of your, uh, meta stores or catalogs that work well across all the different tech stacks is a very important investment. I think it's time for us to do something in that space. I think I have a very different take on it, actually. Okay. Um, so to me, um, the meta store and the actual table format are very tightly intertwined. Um, and, and so I think that the survival of the Hive meta store depends on the, the survival of basically the Hive concept of tables, which is that we track a whole bunch of partitions and we list the files in those partitions and then that's what you get. That, you know, being able to say to a system, hey, these directories, those are a table is a very powerful yet simple concept. And I think that that has, is what kept it around for a really long time. Now, I, I think that arguably the simplicity and the power of doing that caused us to keep it around for way too long and not fix the underlying problems like lack of transactions, um, a you know, simply, simply lack of a source of truth in, in the Hive catalog and you know, many, many issues like that. But I, I think that it's really the table format and, and lack of uh, uh, you know, movement in that space that has kept it alive as, as long as it has. Now, I, I think we also, it'll be interesting to see if we talk about the future, because I, I, because of that, my thesis that table formats and metadata layers are, are pretty tightly coupled, um, I'm, I'm less bullish on the idea that we're going to have one metadata layer necessarily that uh, is, is universal, right? That works for, um, for like iceberg and hoodie and hive. Like, I, I think I would be more inclined to say, we're probably going to have a multi-catalog future, which is where I, you know, just like in, in say Trino, 
I can say, uh, you know, go to my MySQL database and pull this table, go to my Postgres database and pull this table, and then go in and fetch this uh, from my, you know, iceberg store. So I think uh, from my perspective, I can, I can think about a few things. Um, first of all, Hive Meta Store, I guess, you know, sometimes I heard, I heard the saying about democracy that it's the least worst system, right? There's no, it, it has a lot of flaws, but there's no better system. So that's one way to look at it. Okay, I think, but another way is that, you know, it was the one of the first uh, to come around. And you can see this, I think, in many products and many technologies. It doesn't have to be the best product, but you have to be one of the first. Maybe you're not the very first. You know, we see that in social networks or search engine. The very first actually, you know, uh, just paved the way to the others. But one of the first did somehow win the market. And I think for any uh, company or organization already using uh, the Hive format and Hive Metastore, the cost to migrate to another um, uh, system is is taken into account, right? And there's always, or there may be, you know, in many cases, other business needs uh, than just migrating my data. So I think um, uh, about the future, you know, I, I think it may be interesting if we would see some technology which will bring a benefit, which is, comparable to how Spark improved MapReduce, right? You can just write pipelines with much less code and much more in a flexible way and not just implement MapReduce in uh, Java or Scala, whatever. And I think uh, that's also an interesting direction, but, but I think it's just mainly because it was one of the first and it's really hard to move data, right? It's like in the nineties or, or the early, um, 2000s, it was like, yeah, you're already on Oracle or whatever, RDBMS, you know, it's very hard to move your data. So I think uh, that may have uh, something to do with it. Yeah, that, that's that's a good take. I, I think like my answer is kind of a, maybe a superset of all of yours. Basically all of them like sound really close to home for me. Uh, I think maybe one thing I can add here is like, yeah, it was one of the like first solutions to the problem, um, but there wasn't much ecosystem when it began, right? It was pretty much Hive, MapReduce, maybe a couple of other tools. Like if I if I had to draw the graph of like time over like amount of Apache projects that have to do with big data, like it kind of grew exponentially after that, um, and they all needed like a set of primitives to work with, like stuff like what is a table, what are partitions, how does a table look like, which tables do I have, like discovery. And like this tool wasn't great, but it was there to answer all those questions. So if I need data discovery, cool, show tables. Uh, if I need to define a schema, I can do that too. Lineage, I'll just stick that as a comment somewhere in the meta story. It was just there. Um, and then once it's there and it's so like deeply ingrained into all the different technologies, it's really also hard to replace because if I have something that's great and does discovery, now I have the meta store and that tool that does discovery. I just have one more tool. Um, and what Ryan said about like source of truth, uh, this is something that sounds like very familiar from, uh, to me because usually like you try to replace something, there's a migration period. And during that, you have two sources of truth and that makes the migration so much harder. Um, and I think that's maybe one of the key drivers why this is still around. Um, okay, so, so taking uh, that topic, like if we had to imagine a world where there isn't a Hive Meta Store, Right, Hive wasn't there or it didn't have a meta store going in, uh, or if I was trying to build something that doesn't have a meta store at all today, like what would that look like? Can you imagine a data lake that doesn't have this component today? All right, Ryan, I know you do. Maybe you start it. <laughs> um, to me, it really comes down to what are we using the Hive meta store for? Um, again, like I, I think that mostly it's tied to you know the table format plus like anything else that Hive needed a central service uh, to run, <laughs> right? Like, but I, the, the stuff that Hive needed, um, I'm not really including. So I look at this from the lens of, of course, table formats. And, and we have tables that are used for SQL-like purposes, right? Where we want transactional guarantees, schema evolution, uh, you know, those sorts of use cases. Now we have modern formats like Apache Iceberg that handle those use cases. 
Um, so I think that that really steals a lot from what we're using Hive for today. And in fact, like, although we're able to continue referencing those tables and track them in a Hive Metastore, I really think that we're going to need something newer with more features that are, you know, more tailored to those formats um, to do things like, you know, multi-table transactions and stuff like that in the future. So I think Hive is losing that large use case. Um, the, the next thing that we use um, Hive tables for is basically situations where we have, we need um, to say, hey, make this directory of stuff look like a table, right? Because the table abstraction makes sense to us in how we interact with this data. Um, but that, that use case in itself only goes so far. I think we overuse that um, because of the loss of structure in a lot of cases. So when we log things through Kafka, we tend to do it in a JSON format. And then the easiest thing to do is just pop all those JSON records in a file. And like we've ended up losing table structure, right? So we're just spewing files into S3 and we need to say, okay, make all this stuff look like, look like a table again. When <clears throat> I, I think that the next evolution of this space is to have you know, really good table formats that provide SQL abstractions like Iceberg, and then stop losing structure when we go between um, data sources. You know, uh, Seshu mentioned like, you don't wanna move data anymore. I couldn't agree more, right? Every time you move data, you're, you're losing structure. Right, you're losing history, or you're losing schema, or you're going through a you know some other format. Um, I think that really what we're going to do is push the boundaries of structure out, and so we will have thing you know basically you know uh, pictures, video files, and things like that that are truly unstructured. Um, and I, I see like semi-structured data like CSV and JSON formats and things like that. Um, becoming a, a very, very small portion of the future. Whether or not the Hive table format is still necessary for the CSV and JSON use cases, I don't know. Um, it'll be an interesting question. Sashu, your take? Um, so when I think about what does the world look like without the Hive Metastore, maybe I'll um, I'll wrap that into when I think um, into the whole catalog conversation a little bit. Um, so when I think the Metastore is a component of a cat of a, this bigger thing called a catalog, and when at least uh, at Intuit we are thinking about the catalogs, we are thinking about the three types of metadata, right? Three types. So there is the physical metadata, which is I think where a lot of uh, Hive Metastore fits in, and what Ryan is talking about kind of fits in very nicely. This is I have a database and a table. That concept everyone seems to like. We need to go map it to the physical things. It's an object store. You need to go map it to that. What's the best way to go about doing it? And I think there is a lot that needs to happen in that space. Then there is the operational uh, metadata. The operational metadata is, um, at least when we think about it, is what, um, uh, how did the table get created? What are the pipelines that are actually coming in and um, and uh, inserting data into that? Who are reading that? Uh, what's uh, is that table available as an ML feature, for example? Right? Is you would take those tables and make them available as different types of assets within the uh, data ecosystem. Uh, so the operational metadata kind of captures those things. Things. And um, I, if you go back to your good old Teradata Vertica days, there is a lot more. There is a lot more nicer uh, stuff that was available operationally, which is which we kind of lost with our move to data lakes. And I'm hoping those things come back. The stats kind of come back, right? The third, I think, is the business metadata. The business metadata is um, is uh, where um, you are actually telling what is that table, who are supposed to use those tables. What um, um, if I'm a brand new person coming in and I want to generate a metric, a churn metric? What table should I go to? And all of that is like tribal knowledge that needs to get in, and that needs to be captured as well. The uh, 
I think when you start thinking catalogs, all those start building up. And a lot of that is driven by this fundamental construct of there is a database and a table and everything gets built around it. So we need to start doing that a lot more. Uh, one of the things I really like what LakeFS brings to the table is that concept of versioning too, is the versioning probably needs to be baked in, right? It's like deltas or there is a level of um, like time travel style versioning, but there is probably versioning that encompasses metadata too. And how do you bring that into, uh, into your catalog, right? I don't know if that is where you are probably heading to, but th that is where I would basically encompass the problem of metadata. This is a uh, meta, high meta store was one of those building blocks, but we need to think, when we think catalogs, we need to think a lot larger. And the nice thing is there is so much going on in that space. There is a lot of investment that is happening in that space that I know there is uh, new things that will come out of it. Good answer. So, sure. my, yeah, sure. So my take, you know, into day tools, obviously you would use some uh, uh, alternative format like Iceberg, uh, UD, or a Delta. But I think one of the parts that you mostly would need to handle yourself, and I second what Sashri said, is the whole discoverability and catalog. Uh, and there's many uh, things, you know, alternatives you can do there. But, but I think that's, uh, that would be, you know, maybe also the missing part, which is not given to you for free. Uh, and I think uh, in today's technologies, that's pretty much the situation, according to my understanding. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, so yeah, I think like something that comes up here a lot, um, basically I think we can all agree on is that like the hive table structure maybe is kind of uh, losing its grip at the moment. Um, it's kind of weird, like if you think about it, like how coupled we are to like the storage layout of those tables. I would go to S3 and actually look at the partitions and all that. I wouldn't dream of doing so something like that with maybe like Redshift or MySQL, right? I don't care how it stores like the underlying files. For some reason on the data lake, I do. Uh, and that's something I think we kind of need to like, understand that this is no longer part of like the ecosystem anymore. We need something better. Um, so, so yeah, I totally agree that dominates. Right, like we we do not want you touching those files underneath. Exactly. That. <laughs> yeah, we need abstractions. We need good abstractions. That's a good abstraction. Um, so definitely, I think like the newer like next generation table formats are are part of the story here. Um, you guys all said like we need the other parts of the story here for like lineage and schema and like, general manageability versioning. Um, so like. Like the, the best practice of like do one thing and do it well, that's not really the high meta store story anymore. It's kind of like do six things and do them okay ish sometimes. Um, so we need a replacement for each one of those. Um, like, I don't think there is a drop in replacement. I don't think that's going to happen. It's probably going to be like an ecosystem of tools, just like we have for a compute or for storage. Uh, we'll have those for metadata as well. Um, yeah, so, so like taking that line, so if we think about what that would look like, how do you see the future basically? Like a few years from now, two or three years from now, um, how is that going to look if you have to imagine it? Right. Oh, uh, me. <laughs> um, I, I really um, agree about like the different uses of metadata. Um, I think that the, the meta store space is probably where a lot of the innovation is going to happen in the next few years. Um, again, I also think that it's very tied to table formats. So Iceberg is a great example where like the, the time travel features you're talking about, right? If you want to include those in your metadata, right? You need to actually, <laughs> you know, like interact quite deeply with the table format. Um, and, and so like, I, I see it as this additional layer on, on top. Um, we absolutely need, you know, to the, the earlier point that the future is heterogeneous, I completely agree. I, th I think we all see that happening, right? And, and so we need this, you know, base layer of, okay, we all understand how to work with this data, you know, the physical um, that, that Sashu was talking about. Um, but we also really cannot forget about the, the business layer and, and other things, right? Like today, 
there's <laughs> there are so many companies that just try to put up walls around their data lake and say, okay, like once you're in, you get access to everything. So things like access control uh, of a real database that works across Spark and Trino and Flink and whatever else you're using, you know, unsolved problem. Same thing with multi-table transactions. Like I said, like we, we are going to need something like here. Um, I, again, think that that's probably going to be multiple um, meta stores, probably very specific to the formats and, and capabilities of the underlying storage. But um, it, it'll be really interesting to see what matures here. I completely agree. I think the table formats would probably be, um, if I think of it, that's probably the next set of boards that will happen. I think come next couple of years, I guess, is um, the um, within uh, within Intuit, we kind of just start, everything is, we just said it's a parquet file. And then we had our own internal file formats, um, not table formats. We had a file format. We kind of just abandoned it. There was so much happening in this space. We said, no, we can't keep up, right? We then picked Delta as um as the format but in no way do i believe that decision is complete i think the delta iceberg hoodie will will probably duke it out in the market i uh, i don't know maybe all three will remain maybe the one of them will actually um come out as the winner um the uh, critical thing for the meta stores and the catalog is that they have to in the short term support all three of them. I don't believe there will be. You can pick one and say you would uh, you would work well in the heterogeneous market. We would we would need um, support for the the core physical layouts. That is your tables. Um, where is my um, my tables, my partitions, and what Ryan was mentioning. If I want to do, how would I support transactions? But I think they probably need to do more than that as well, right? They would probably need to uh, do things like. Um, uh, what what we are talking about at the other layers, like would, would I do something at the operational layer? Would I do something at the business layer? Those type of things kind of need to get baked in. Um, how would the table formats have an impact on these other layers that we build in our catalog would be something that I'm sure will um, will get nailed out in the next couple of years as, um, as we work out uh, which one comes out the winner. I know I've heard some of the things with Iceberg. I know there the amount of clarity I've heard with Iceberg. We definitely want to give it a try too. But at, at the present thing, we were we were focused on uh, making that transition to Delta. So, in my perspective, I I I, I believe the Lake House trend is very interesting uh, as as a global set of technologies, right? Um, not just the, the DataWorks, of course. Uh, Personally, but by the way, in Salesforce, I think we have we use we use Databricks and we also use icebergs and have some committers, uh, which are really interested in that. And I think this trend will continue, right? Better support for transaction management and uh, new real time and batch processing uh, unified in some way. That's also really important. And I think um, uh, I, I guess you know I wouldn't be surprised if. To at least two of the three uh, formats we mentioned will uh, continue to uh, evolve and have successful usages, and maybe there would be more. I think what we saw in some of the history is that projects which do tend to be more open uh, can, drain, can get more committers and, and better ecosystem. And I think Hive Metastore and Hive in general is a perfect example for that. And I think that would also maybe a, a drive a driver for, uh, for some of the, I guess, uh, who, who wins uh, uh, question, you know, to get an answer on that, but remains to be seen, of course. But I think uh, the is still in that. Yeah, so that, that's really good answers. Like one of the things I'm, I'm thinking is that like Hive Metastore in itself, like being that the monolith that it is, uh, would have a really hard time to kind of adapt to the changes that the market's going through. Um, I think maybe one of the, the key things that it does that it does do well is that it's adopted by others, right? I can use the same tables between my Trino query and my Spark job and 
any other framework, basically. Even if you don't like it, it's kind of a standard. And I think it allows for interoperability, which I think is really important. Um, and this is maybe also like the concern, assuming that the future is kind of like um, where we have multiple tools and uh, there's a good ecosystem of metadata tools as well. Um, whether or not a standard or a set of standards merge to allow that interoperability, I think that's going to be a very interesting question. Right. So if you don't have the high band store, can I define a table in Trino and then read it from Spark? Would that be possible? And if so, like at what cost? Um, so these are going to be, at least for me, very interesting questions to see get answered. Um, all right, so we talked a lot about the meta store itself. Um, and that's, as we understand, it's it's half the story. Um, there are a lot of other tools involved if you want to create like a good data lake deployment. Uh, so you would need the storage layer. You would need uh, compute tools, usually more than one of those, um, ML tooling, uh, a lot of different use cases. Um, so if you had to imagine not only like the metadata part, but like the entire like data lake, what it looks like maybe five years from now, uh, what do you see changing? Or what trends do you see like maybe increasing or decreasing? Ryan. Um, so I, I mentioned one already, which is that I, I think we're going to push out the boundaries of structured data and we're going to keep data in more structured forms um, throughout. So this will be things like um, in, in Kafka streams, having typed records, um, you know, people already want that <laughs> and there are solutions to do it. Um, so like, you know, uh, then we have CDC, uh, you know, flowing data into to iceberg tables. Um, those sorts of things I think are going to maintain structure and um, that's a, a pretty big trend. Um, so we'll, we'll care a lot less about files in S3. Um, one thing that I, I think is, is definitely not going to happen is just giving up the meta store. So I know that there's this dream that a lot of people have to like only use S3 and like point to a location in a file system. Um, and I, you know, we've been talking about all the other metadata uses. I just don't see that happening. In fact, I, I see this getting more important. Layering on authorization and access control that works across um, all of the heterogeneous store, or sorry, compute engines that you're using, um, absolutely going to happen. You also need things that just keep track of everything. You, you can't say like all the stuff that happens to be in this bucket, that's my data warehouse. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to have catalogs that keep track of tables in a bucket and, and those sorts of things. That said, I really do think that the future is multi catalog. Um, I, I think that we will probably have a space of catalogs where you have one for Databricks. You know, if you you know want to use Delta, you, you pay for the Databricks catalog. Um, we will probably have something built up around Iceberg. Um, we'll have you know maybe Hoodie. I'm not sure what the plan is there. They might maybe going for the um, you know files and, and file system kind of approach. Um, but I, I think that that layer is going to be specific to tables and also get a lot more complex, um, like I said. Sasha? Uh, I will completely agree with what uh, Ryan is saying in terms of um, the, uh, we will just not go to like point to an S3 bucket and say, this is, um, this is your um, uh, data lake. Um, we are in fact actually going the other, uh, the other direction. We are going to, for example, the authentication and authorization. We are uh, fine-grained access control is a big initiative that uh, we have embarked on. That is, um, we want to set permissions at individual tables. We are actually going nuts. We are putting it on rows and columns as well, not just the uh, not just tables. Um, the um, the multi-catalog is a very interesting conversation. So at least in my um, uh, in my mental model, I did not think that they would be there. Uh, the reason that makes this problem that much more interesting is things like access control policies. We probably want to define it once as opposed to defining it in four different places um, because we will still have a single uh, single lake. We don't uh, single, if I have four catalogs, I'll have to define the things across four separate catalogs. Maybe we need a layer on top that, uh, that takes care of it. I don't know, right? So that would be 
um, an interesting thing to um, uh, to worry about. I would, uh, with uh, respect to um, uh, things like um, uh, the type of things you will build on top of the material, I think there will be more and more things we will be doing as opposed to um, just treating, um, uh, in fact, I would probably go back to um, uh, go back to the world where there was so much more structure in, in our good old days, right? In our good old days of teradators and verticals, like uh, yeah, it's bad, bad words. You probably not want to go say there was a lot more um, structure that we we put in a lot more emphasis on the structure of the data. We um, uh, I'm not saying we will go back onto the schema schema on um, right for no we will not I think that that uh, is gone but the emphasis for example we are putting into into it on um, uh, data stewardship and defining the schemas is um, it, it's a company wide initiative now saying you need to know what the data is you need to define the schema for the data and you need to maintain that right not just defining it once but continuously maintain what the schema of the data is so you don't spend a, a lots of time trying to consume that data that's um and i was probably trying to answer where we are heading with it i don't know if um, i completely answered the questions that you are looking for i think it's an interesting take I mean, you touched a lot of like points around that and challenges that we should be expecting at least yeah your your take yeah i think two interesting things which will continue to evolve is well as i previously mentioned uh, transaction support uh, uh, and uh, consistency. And I think uh, I do agree with uh, Seshu and Ryan, the structureness will continue to evolve. And I think there's a need for that also from, uh, from the perspective of queries, optimizations and runtimes. I think the user will want uh, batch processing to, to last less time uh, and be more interactive. And I think we do see this trend with uh, recent Databricks uh, products right, like the Lake House. And I wouldn't be surprised if the metadata um, will also support things like we, we see as indexes, right? In, in the traditional databases. Uh, to some extent, th this kind of metadata already exists in formats now, but I think it may continue to evolve. Uh, like the trend would be take the data lake and the data warehouse and somehow unify them and uh, that's my take on it yeah so like the, the way i see it is that there are kind of two forces pulling in kind of opposite directions uh where you have like the data lake vendors let's call them companies like snowflake and databricks uh which are very much pushing for like vertical integration right you, you pay one vendor and you get like the whole suite of things from metadata management through to the storage and the table formats all the way up to like the libraries that you use to interact with the data. Um, I think they're really pushing towards kind of that world where they own the entire stack. Um, whereas you have like the cloud providers and the open source communities, um, not in the same way, but pulling for like multiple products and many different tools, um, kind of more like the data lake dream as we know it, right? where I can just bring my own tools. And if they do a good job of my specific use cases, I could just use them uh, for the same data and using the same access controls and the same metadata layers uh, that everyone else is using. But I get to use my own tools. Like I get to choose them. Uh, for the cloud providers, it means usually choosing like the tools that they offer you. Uh, so you just pick one of those. Uh, in many cases, it's based on open source. Um, and for, I guess, the user community, ideally, uh, what we'd like to see is for me to be able to bring any which tool, maybe something from Databricks to do one thing, something from the cloud provider to do the other, um, and something completely open source that I host myself uh, or that I built myself to interact with the data, um, where the common like the common ground that everyone is interacting with is kind of the storage and the table layers. Right? This is why metadata is such an important topic. Um, so it, it's kind of a question of like who wins, right? Whether it's like the convenience of vertical integration or like being able to bring your own tools, which one of those would be would come out on top? I think it's going to be a very interesting battle in life. Uh, do you think that it is who wins or who won? 
because I, I just learned about Intuit's uh, data platform today through this discussion. And it looks like Netflix, Apple, LinkedIn, Twitter, name a tech company, what they're doing, right? The, the future is already heterogeneous, right? It, Databricks and Snowflake have a, a place in that world, right? Like, but they're not the sole thing that everyone is using. Everyone, you know, like uh, Netflix using like Snowflake, it's just part of the data architecture for certain use cases. Um, it's not the, the whole thing. And so I, I don't think that, that I would push back on the uh, expectation that um, there's a chance of them winning. I think they've already lost the like single vendor thing. The future is heterogeneous. The, the question is how we tie everything together through, um, you know, open data, this open data stack, right? Open formats, uh, metadata and, and, you know, projects that, that allow you to pick and choose. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's still maybe a place for that vertical integration. Uh, maybe not at that part of the market though. Like if, if you're yeah. a smaller company and you don't have the engineering resources, vertical integration and maybe even vendor lock-in in a way could sometimes be a good thing. Like I, I absolutely... little attention and get a lot of value initially. And then maybe it's going to be a hard battle to kind of escape that walled garden. Um, and I think maybe for a lot of companies, that's a good way to get started or like to get a leg up. Because as you said, data is the new oil. I think they were said that. Uh, I, that's exactly true. And if you don't play that game, you're going to lose, right? And it doesn't matter which size company you are. Um, so yeah, maybe for the Netflixes and Intuits of the world and Salesforces, that's not the case. It's probably not for them, uh, not long term. Um, but maybe for a, a large section of the market, this could be. It. I, I think though that you know you're you're not going to find that maybe below a certain scale or or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's just not going to. It, but the, I could say the same thing about like. Trino, right? Like, okay, I can I can run my data warehouse on on Trino um, below a certain scale, but I'm going to have use cases and and things as we grow. So, um, I, I agree with you that it is, you know, there is definitely a use case for having just one, and that would be ideal. But I, I don't see that being like the the future of of you know large data organizations. If data is oil, then you know, we're, we're going to have this heterogeneous future. I would probably yeah. agree with Ryan on that front too. Even if your scale is small, um, you would not be able to justify a vendor uh, with the vertical integration. You'll probably just go make it open. You could probably just do open source and be happy with it too. Um, the vertical integration comes with a price. Uh, sometimes you may not be, so uh, you would want to still, even with the small scale, want to, uh, have a couple of choices so that you're not, you, you don't pick either only one of them, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, so I do agree with uh, Oz, I think, uh, uh, or basically all, with all, all of you, you know, there's different solutions for different companies and different profiles. Uh, not all companies can actually recruit and, and invest in a big big data team. Uh, and have that uh, uh, expertise. So for them, you know, th there may be another solution. And I think even within uh, the giants of the world, like Netflix and, the, and maybe Intuit and, and other companies, uh, there's also room for many solutions because there are many use cases and business needs. And, um, and I, I think we are going to see more and more cases and uh, each, each company will, or each product will try to improve and make the best and, in a way, that's really good, right? Because everyone's improving. So, uh, but 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 I'm I'll, personally, I wouldn't bet on having one winner at all. And I think there would be a few. Uh, I do second that. All right. So we have about ten minutes left. So I have one last question, and and maybe after that, we'll try to pick up some questions from the chat here because I see that there are a few. Um, so maybe shortly, if you had like one tip that you could give uh, someone that's kind of building out a new data lake today, starting from scratch, what, what, would, what would you give them as a tip? Right. Um, I think that probably the most important productivity gain that, that we uh, released to users at Netflix was um, Iceberg, 
honestly. Um, I'm, I'm totally biased. I'll admit yeah, that. It's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, but it, it focused a lot on restoring the SQL table abstraction so that, you know, in a year you can rename a, a column or drop data, you know, drop a column without ruining your data. Um, things like that prevent days or months of cleanup work and headache for, for users. And I think our unique focus on productivity and you know, building those, those things and not just saying, oh, it needs to be, um, you know, we need to fix transactions and then move on. Um, I, I think that that is unique to Iceberg and I would highly recommend just you know, checking it out and, and seeing what you can do. Definitely don't just go with Hive. Right, choose some modern table format. <laughs> <laughs> That's sound advice. <laughs> Issue. Um, the um, one of the biggest um, and probably the initiatives that is happening within Intuit is uh, what we call as the clean data at the source. Uh, this is um, uh, this is not just the classic data engineering teams, but we are going to each and every uh, BU uh, data producers and. Uh, saying invest in um, understanding the schemas of the data and um, create the data that can be consumed. Um, if I'm going and starting a brand new data lake today, I would actually encourage uh, folks to go do that. I think if you start with clean data and then keep maintaining the clean data, the amount of downstream processing that needs to happen, you can really cut down on it. And things like good um, uh, uh, table formats that will support a lot of things that you need are critical in that journey. I agree, you are. So uh, obviously I second that, you know, consider uh, the table formats, the new table formats. Um, from my experience, and this is kind of a more generic thing, I think one of the two things to keep in mind when designing a new data lake is, is to really um, get your architecture or fix your architecture according to the team which is going to work on it and going into the business case. Really try to take that in advance. Sometimes you can have a more limited solution or an easier or faster solution if you just optimize specifically to the use case. You don't have to be the most generic platform. That's one thing. And also really take, try to take into account the motivations and the knowledge and the interest of the team. Are they you know, how do they feel about open source? Do they prefer uh, um, specific vendors? because once you have them engaged, uh, the success rate uh, would be a bit bigger. Um, and I think that's uh, often things, you know, which gets lost in uh, the technical details, uh, these things. So that's my take on it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so I think maybe one thing I can add here um, is that we're human. So we kind of need to acknowledge the fact that if you're building something new, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. I mean, we want to be able to kind of learn and adapt and improve as we go. Um, so maybe my tip would be to make the cost of mistake uh, lower than than possible, by as low as you can get it, basically. So it means investing in stuff like versioning. Of course, I have my own biases here, um, but also in observability and logging, uh, monitoring, providing the right training for the team who's going to be working with the technologies invest time in kind of understanding under, under the hood uh, the technologies that you're implementing, uh, not just reading what the front page says uh, and then being disappointed, uh, especially because it's such a young ecosystem and so many of the tools are still kind of new and rough around the edges. Uh, understanding how they work and like their limitations is super important. Uh, so once you know all that and you can experiment quickly and kind of understand where things are going, roll back if they don't, um, your chance of success are just higher. Right, you, you, just because you can move faster and iterate quicker. Um, all right, so we have five minutes. So before the closing words, let's try and pick a few questions from the audience. And I see that we already have a few. Um, so question from Dennis. Uh, what do you think can Hive in a store be improved instead of completely replaced, uh, which might be a problem because it's used by Spark, Trino, Presto, all those. Any takers? Uh, I could take this on. I'm not actually sure that I see a future without the Hive Metastore. Um, Hive Metastore does what it does pretty well. And there may be use cases where we have semi-structured data flowing in and you want to say, 
make a table out of this. So I see its use is diminishing, but I don't know that I see the, the format and, and everything going away. Um, I do think though that the easiest way to migrate or sorry, avoid migration is to set up parallel meta stores, right? So this is obvious in Trino, but um, like where in Trino, you just define a new catalog and then that's a new table space. Um, that's probably how we're going to deal with this problem of everything being in, intertwined uh, in the Hive Meta Store. It's you're going to set up a, another catalog in your uh, Trino or uh, Spark or even Flink, like they all support this um, and, and work with those tables in parallel. Yeah, I agree, that's, that's a good answer. Um, all right, let's pick another one. Ashwin asks regarding files, does the way you architect your metadata store impact whether you're using Parquet or C or Avro in the data lake? Like, does the meta store impact the, your choices of file format? Yes and no. <laughs> so um, Iceberg supports all three formats underneath um, the, the table. So if you're someone who knows how to tune ORC files, um, you should be able to continue using ORC files. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Now, uh, Avro has a different use case than like Parquet or Orc. So you should keep that in mind. Um, and then other uh, table formats, you know, don't support things. So I think uh, Delta only supports Parquet. Is that correct? Yeah. And um, I think Hoodie has its own file format for new data and then eventually compacts into Parquet, uh, possibly Orc. So like it, it kind of depends. Um, your, your choice of table format will inform your, your uh, file format requirement. Yeah. Um, Seshu, I think maybe this one uh, is a good one for you. You touched on security uh, and, and the things you're doing into it. So a question from Rui. Um, do you see functionality for having data segregation without the need for data duplication? Can it be achieved without a catalog? Data segregation without data du um Data segregation. Could you repeat that again? Sorry. Yeah, I, th I think what I'm just trying to say is that can we do like if we want to guard like one part of a table, can we do it without actually like materializing it again, like building another like materialized view for it, like another copy of it, just for the sake of security? If we don't have the catalog. Catalog. Um. I, I yeah. So maybe I'll start with saying I don't envision a world without a catalog. Too. Uh, catalog is fundamental uh, to uh, to the data lakes. I, uh, that's true with any databases. I think it's true with the data lakes too. Um, the uh, the the place where we will head to is um is the uh, the catalogs becoming more aware um, of um. Uh, the the access policies themselves becoming part of the catalog and um, be, uh, specifying. So if you want to mask out a set of fields, that would be uh, something you would have a tight uh, relationship with your IAM rules. And you would say which, which role has access to what parts of the table would kind of get built into your catalogs. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we are almost out of time. Uh, Thank you guys so much uh, for taking the time uh, and, and participating. I think it was a super interesting discussion. I think the future uh, is going to be really a, a, fun, a fun thing to watch from the side and definitely fun to be a part of. Um, maybe we should host another thing maybe in two years uh, with the same questions and see whether or not we got it right. Um, so just to kind of continue the conversation with the rest of the community, um, let me just share this real quickly. Um, this. So, so we have uh, on our on forum.lakefs.io, uh, we, we have a few questions in place where we can kind of continue the conversation. Uh, so if you're part of the audience uh, and also you guys on the panel, uh, feel free to jump in there uh, with like questions and continue the discussion there. Um, and again, thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Uh, we'll see you again maybe soon. Uh, for something uh, else that's exciting around metadata. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.